In chapter 21, we will be discussing nucleic acids. This is the outline for our discussion on nucleic acids. We'll start off with a short introduction. Then we'll talk about the building blocks of nucleic acids, nucleotides, and then the nucleic acid structure as shown here for DNA, the replication process for the DNA molecule, and then we'll talk about protein synthesis in its relation to both RNA and DNA and the genetic code. And finally, we'll wrap up with some discussion on applications of nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are molecules that are in all living cells. They function to both store and transmit genetic information. An example of that is the nucleic acid DNA. It holds the genetic code for replication. In other words, if I have a cell, and as it starts to divide, that genetic information, which is held in chromosomes, starts to replicate. That replicated DNA is now present in each of the two new cells. Another example is where I have one cell coming together with a second cell, sharing that genetic information. In this case, I have a sperm cell combining with an egg cell to form a life form. The second type of genetic information transmitting is where I have DNA. It has the genetic information for making proteins, but first it is transferred over to RNA, and then that genetic code is used to actually synthesize proteins in living organisms. So I have DNA transmitting information over to RNA, which then allows the cells to make proteins. Here are just two diagrams, which we'll discuss in more detail later in the chapter, where I have DNA in the nucleus of a cell. It transcribes its information over to RNA, which then leaves the cell nucleus and is into the cytoplasm. And that's where that information is used within ribosomes to start making proteins. This is just another graphic of the same process. There are two types of nucleic acids. One is DNA, and that stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And the second is ribonucleic acid, or RNA. The DNA nucleic acid is found within the cell nucleus. It stores and transfers genetic information, and it passes this on during cell division via the mitosis process. RNA occurs in all parts of the cell, book, so in the nucleus and outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm. Its primary function involves protein synthesis. If we look at these two molecules, this represents a DNA molecule. It is sort of wound up here into a double helix, meaning two strands. I have a blue strand here, and I have a red strand here. In between these strands holding them together are these molecules that we're going to call nitrogenous bases, and we'll discuss that in more detail here. If we look at the RNA molecule, it is a single strand, so it is a alpha helix also, but it's a single-stranded alpha helix. It also has these nitrogenous bases on it that are here, but it contains one that is different than DNA. The RNA molecule has a uracil nitrogenous base, where DNA has a thymine nitrogenous base. All the others are the same, adenine, adenine, guadenine, guanine, cytosine, and cytosine. We'll talk more about these in depth as we move through the chapter. So nucleic acids are composed of smaller units called nucleotides. We can think of these nucleotides as a monomer, and we can think of the DNA and the RNA as polymers, bringing these smaller groups together to make larger molecules.
Our monomer units are called nucleotides, and they are the building blocks of nucleic acids, both RNA and DNA strands. Nucleotides are composed of some subunits. Each of them has a sugar, and it is a pentose monosaccharide. For RNA, this sort of blue region represents a sugar. Notice that it has a hydroxyl group at carbon number two here. If I look at DNA, it contains a very similar sugar, but it does not have a hydroxyl here at carbon number two. Each of my nucleotides has a phosphate group, as shown here in yellow for RNA, and yellow here for DNA. It also contains a nitrogenous base, which is an amine. You can see here the nitrogenous bane in this case is adenine, and it contains several different nitrogen groups in here. I have the same one drawn here for the nitrogenous base of DNA. So the basic structure of the monomer units, nucleotides, is a phosphate, sugar, and a base covalently bound together. These groups come together to make this three-dimensional structure or polymer structure. The nitrogenous bases are represented by these little sticks that point out on RNA or these sticks that bridge the two different helixes in DNA. The sugars and phosphate make up these helical structures, both in RNA and DNA. Let's take a closer look at the three substructures that make up the nucleotides. Let's first look at the sugar. They are pentose sugars, which means they contain five carbons. One, two, three, four, five. RNA contains ribose sugar, so this is beta D ribose. DNA contains two deoxyribose, so it's a very similar sugar, however, is missing one OH group, and here it's represented by hydrogen. So this would be a beta D two prime deoxyribose sugar. Okay. So the only difference between these two sugars is that hydroxyl group and hydrogen on carbon number two. Otherwise, these sugars would be the beta anomer, they are the D stereoisomer, and they are a five carbon sugar. The phosphate group is attached to the 5 prime hydroxy group of the ribose sugar, as shown here in this diagram for an RNA nucle nucleotide, carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here's my phosphate ester linkage to carbon number 5. In some nucleotides, multiple phosphates may be sequentially attached to another one. What, in other words, I could have another phosphate group sticking out here, so I have a diphosphate, or I could have three phosphates out there, a triphosphate. Under physiological conditions, this phosphate is an anion. You can see here that's represented by these negative charges here. And the third building block of a nucleotide are the nitrogenous bases. These are nitrogen-containing heterocyclic bases, and there are a total of five of them. We can classify them into two different types based on the type of heterocyclic ring that the nitrogenous base looks like. For example, there are three of them that have the pyrimidine derivatives, meaning they have a six-membered heterocyclic ring with two nitrogens in it. They would be thymine, cytosine, and uracil. Thymine is only in DNA, cytosine is in both RNA and DNA, and uracil is only in RNA. The second type of nitrogenous bases are the purine derivatives. This is, represents the purine molecule again. It is a two-ring heterocyclic rings. Those nitrogenous bases are adenine and guanine. Nucleotides are the building blocks of nucleic acids, both DNA and RNA. If I look at this example, 
can I look at it and tell if this is an RNA nucleotide or a DNA nucleotide? If I look quickly at two prime carbon on the sugar, it has a hydroxyl group on here. So therefore, this nucleotide is a building block for an RNA nucleotide. This is adenine here, which is in both RNA and DNA. So this is a RNA nucleotide. We can visualize the formation of a nucleotide in a two-step process. We have a pento sugar, as shown here in blue, reacting with a nitrogenous base, shown here in darker blue purple. They react through a condensation reaction to form what we call a nucleoside. That's a two unit group here. Notice in this case, this again would be the ribose nucleoside because it has a hydroxyl group here at carbon two prime. This is a condensation reaction because we release out a small molecule of water. In this case, the condensation reaction always occurs at the anomeric carbon in the ribose sugar carbon one prime, which is only in the beta configuration. So that's the same side as this carbon number five. And it always attaches to either the N1 carbon of a pyrimidine or the N9 carbon, which is shown here, of the purine molecule. So the condensation reaction is a one prime nine condensation for purines. And for pyrimidines, it would be a one to one with the nitrogen there. There are eight common nucleosides that make up DNA and RNA. There are four ribonucleosides that make up the nucleosides within RNA, and there are four deoxyribonucleosides. If we look at the four different nucleosides in RNA, there is adenosine, which has a ribose sugar and adenine as the nitrogenous base. We have guanosine, which has the ribose sugar and guanine for the nitrogenous base. Notice these both end with seen. So when we have a purine, Scientists use the suffix O-S-I-N-E to identify the different types of nucleosides. The third type of nucleoside in RNA is cytidine. It contains a ribose sugar and the nitrogenous base cytosine. And uridine, which contains the ribose sugar and the nitrogenous base uracil. For the purine, scientists use the suffix I-D-I-N-E to identify the different nucleosides. For the DNA nucleosides, we add the prefix deoxy in front of those to identify the sugar as a deoxy, missing a hydroxy group here at carbon number two. So this one would be deoxyadenosine. So it has a deoxyribose sugar and it has the nitrogenous base adenine. The oxyguanosine, that contains the deoxyribose sugar and the nitrogenous base guanine. We have deoxycytidine, which contains the deoxyribose sugar, and it contains the nitrogenous base cytosine. And finally, the eighth nucleoside is a deoxythiamine, the thymidine nucleoside. It contains the deoxyribose sugar and it contains the nitrogenous base thymine. The second chemical reaction is to react our nucleosides with the phosphate group, again, another condensation reaction to form 
a phosphate ester linkage. So my nucleoside plus the phosphate group results in our nucleotide, which is the building block again for both RNA and DNA. Nucleotides are named by including the word 5-monophosphate after the nucleoside name. So if I know what the nucleoside is, for example, in this molecule here, it's guanosine, I just add the suffix 5-monophosphate, or GMP, guanosine monophosphate. Here's a table which lists the nitrogenous bases for DNA and the nitrogenous bases for RNA. It also lists the abbreviation for those nitrogenous bases. The nucleoside name for both DNA and RNA. And finally, the nucleotides for both DNA and RNA. The one I'd like to point out is adenine for RNA. Its nucleoside is named adenosine. Its nucleotide is adenosine 5-monophosphate. We often refer to this as just AMP. We're going to see this AMP molecule outside of nucleic acid chemistry when we start discussing metabolism. So keep that in mind, adenosine monophosphate. Nucleotides come together to form nucleic acids via a condensation reaction between nucleotides. And that always occurs between the phosphate group on one nucleotide and the hydroxy group on one of the sugars of a second nucleotide. In this case, it always happens at the three prime hydroxy group so carbon number one, two, three. And it always happens at the five prime phosphate group. One, two, three, four, five carbons, that's the phosphate. So when they react via a condensation reaction to form a new phosphoester linkage, we call it a three prime, five prime phosphodiester linkage because I have two phosphate esters here and I'm combining them at carbon number three and carbon number five here. The primary structure of a nucleic acid is based on the sequence of nucleotides that are connected together via these three prime, five prime phosphodiester linkages between one nucleotide a second nucleotide, a third nucleotide, and a fourth nucleotide in this short sequence of nucleotides. And the way we tend to name these is solely based on the bases because that's the only thing that's different. My phosphate group here and my sugar group are the same for each of these molecules. Is this nucleic acid uh, RNA nucleic acid or a DNA nucleic acid. I first go right down here to the two prime carbon and I notice there's a hydrogen here. So this is a deoxyribose nucleic acid coming together to form this larger nucleic acid here. So there is directionality associated with the three dimensional structure of a nucleic acid. There is a five prime end and there is a three prime end. And when we name nucleic acids, we typically start off at the top here at the five prime end and name the different nitrogenous bases in the order that they appear until we get down to the three prime end. Three prime again, because I have nothing attached to my three prime carbon, five prime, because I just have a phosphate group. I don't have any more nucleotides attached to that five prime end. So we're just going to name, in this case, the DNA molecule, thymine, guanine, cytosine, adenine. That would be my primary structure 
for this nucleic acid. Let's summarize what we've learned so far about nucleic acids. RNA and DNA are nucleic acid polymers. We can describe them as being polynucleotides, where the nucleotides are our monomer units. RNA and DNA are similar in that the backbone of the nucleic acid is a series of alternating sugars and phosphate groups held together by 3 prime, 5 prime phosphodiester linkages. The differences between DNA and RNA nucleic acids are 1. The DNA sugar lacks the 2 hydroxy group, as shown here. Deoxyribose, notice on carbon number 2 again, I have a hydrogen. If I look at the RNA sugar ribose, it has a hydroxyl group here at carbon number 2, the ribose sugar. The DNA uses the bases adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, where RNA uses the bases adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. The only difference is the thymine versus the uracil, and even those molecules are very similar in structure. If I look at thymine, I recognize that it is a heterocyclic ring, and at this carbon right here, I have a methyl substituent on it. If I look at uracil, I have a hydrogen on that carbon. So they're very, very similar in structure. But RNA only uses uracil, and DNA only uses thymine as its nitrogenous base. Let's look at the primary structure of both DNA and RNA. That primary structure of any nucleic acid is going to be the sequence of nucleotides. In both DNA and RNA, that sequence is just the sequence of bases starting from the 5' prime end going down to the 3' prime end in a nucleic acid. Here are two different examples. Let's start off by looking at the one on the left. Is that an RNA or a DNA nucleic acid? If I first look at the sugar, I notice that there's a hydroxyl group here at the 2' prime carbon of the sugar. Therefore, this molecule must be RNA. Another way to confirm that is I look at the nitrogenous bases, and one of them in this nucleic acid is uracil, so it also has to identify this as RNA because RNA contains uracil and DNA does not. We then need to identify my 5 prime N, so I look at the molecule and this phosphate is a monophosphate ester that is going to be the 5 prime end. The other end has a hydroxyl group that is not an ester linkage. That's going to be my 3 prime end. So to identify the primary structure of this RNA molecule, I'm just going to list the nitrogenous bases starting from the 5 prime end. That would be adenine, cytosine, guanine, or urus and uracil. Putting those all together, the primary structure would be ACGU, just abbreviated with one letter acronyms. If I look at this molecule, can I determine if this is an RNA or a DNA nucleic acid? If I look here, the sugars and the phosphates are just represented by these circles here, so I don't have any information about the type of sugar. But if I look at the nitrogenous basis, I notice that thiamine is one of the nitrogenous bases that only occurs in DNA, so this is a DNA nucleic acid. Up here at the top, I need to identify whether this is my 5' prime or my 3' prime end. In this case, it's going to be my 5' prime end because I'm always looking at that phosphate on the 5' prime carbon of the sugar. And down here would be my 3' prime end identified by this monophosphate ester here on this sugar. Then we're going to just start naming our nitrogenous bases in order. G, 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 T, G, A, H, C, T, C. That would be my primary structure for this nucleic acid. Guanine, 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 thymine, guanine, adenine, adenine, cytosine, thymine, cytosine here. 
Also notice that I've drawn this DNA molecule as only a single strand, but we know that DNA forms a double helix. It has two strands through that. Let's talk about how this single strand combines with a second strand to form this alpha double helix. Let's now look at how we form the secondary structure of DNA. We're going to use this nucleic acid here as our model compound. It is a nucleic acid made out of four separate nucleotides. Each has a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. If I look closely at the sugar, there is a hydrogen at the two prime carbon. Therefore, this nucleic acid is a DNA nucleic acid. I could also look at the nitrogenous bases. I have adenine, cytosine, guanine and thymine, and thymine only occurs in DNA molecules. So this is an indeed a DNA strand of nucleic acid, and it is just a single strand. Scientists have gone into the laboratory and they've shown that DNA exists as a double helix. In other words, it has two strands of a DNA chain. So I have one coming up this way. I have a second one coming up this way. They're both spiraling, so they're forming helixes. Studies have also shown that these helixes are held together by interactions between the nitrogenous bases of one strand and the nitrogenous bases of another strand to form the double helix. If we look at this molecule, I can see that there are nitrogens and oxygen sticking out of the nitrogenous bases. Those can undergo hydrogen bonding. Let's look at some examples. Cytosine here can form three hydrogen bonds to guanine between the hydrogen on the nitrogen and the lone pair of electrons on oxygen. Between the lone pair of electrons on nitrogen and the hydrogen on nitrogen of guanine and the lone pair of electrons on cytosine with the hydrogen on the nitrogen of guanine. That would be the same for this guanine. It would like to pair up with a cytosine molecule of another strand forming three separate hydrogen bonds here. These are considered base pairs, nitrogenous base pairs. Adenine here, it has two atoms that could form hydrogen bonds. And it turns out that thymine also has two atoms that can form hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen of the amine, the lone pair of electrons with oxygen, the lone pair of electrons on nitrogen, and the hydrogen on this cyclic amine. So adenine and thymine like to pair up and so forth. I go down here, thymine likes to pair up with adenine. We call these base pairs. All I need now is to include all the sugars and phosphates that are actually attached to these nitrogenous bases. So if I put in the sugars and if I were to make those phosphate ink phosphoester linkages, I would then have two strands of nucleic acid that are held together by the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases on each side. So the secondary structure of nucleic acids, which is the alpha double helix, they're held together in this structure by hydrogen bonds. Let's look at a closer view of those hydrogen bonds formed between complementary nitrogenous bases. We call them complementary because thymine always likes to pair up and form hydrogen bonds with adenine, and cytosine always likes to form hydrogen bonds and pair up with guanine. In the case of the thymine adenine base pair, we have two hydrogen bonds that are formed. In the case of the cytosine guanine, we have three hydrogen bonds that are formed. If we look at a two-dimensional diagram of that, you can see I always have a hydrogen forming a hydrogen bond with a lone pair of electrons on another atom. The hydrogen on nitrogen 
forming a hydrogen bond with a lone pair of electrons and nitrogen. And the same thing's true with the cytosine guanine base pairing. The secondary structure of DNA is a double helix. That double helix contains two nucleic acid chains that are coiled around each other in this alpha helix, represented here by this blue chain and this orange chain, two different nucleic acid chains. These two polynucleotide chains are considered to be anti-parallel with each other. Anti meaning this blue one here starts here at the five prime end at the top of this chain, where its complementary chain starts at the three prime end. So in this case, we call those anti to each other, but they're also parallel in this double helix. Complementary to each other means that for every adenine I have, it pairs up with a thymine, and that's due to hydrogen bonding. In the case of adenine and thymine, there are two hydrogen bonds formed. And in case of guanine and cytosine, there are three hydrogen bonds formed. So if I look at this double helix over here, whenever I have a guanine on one chain of my nucleic acid, there is a cytosine on the complementary chain and so forth. Thymine pairs up with adenine, cytosine with guanine, adenine with thymine, and so forth down there. So if I were to analyze the DNA and analyze for the nitrogenous bases, the percent of adenine in DNA is equal to the percent of thymine because they're always paired up, and the percentage of cytosine is always equal to the percentage of guanine in a molecule. They're also just paired up. When one looks at a DNA double helix in the laboratory, one is able to see that the distance between these two individual nucleic acid chains is always the same. Even though they're made up of different hydrogen bonds, thymine to adenine and cytosine to guanine, if we look at the geometries of these two base pairs, again, thymine to adenine, and measure, and let's pick a common point, this nitrogen to that nitrogen here, I measure 1.085 nanometers for one base pair. If I go from a similar nitrogen to another nitrogen on my cytosine guanine pair, it also equals 1.085 nanometers. Therefore, all of my base pairs are equal in distance, and therefore I have this just about perfect double helix formed when my complementary bases come together by hydrogen bonding. Let's now determine the primary structure of each of my nucleic acid chains. We know that, again, adenine always forms a base pair with thymine, and cytosine always forms a base pair with guanine. In this example here, I've sort of taken it and unwound the double helix so it's easier to look at those base pairs and the nitrogenous bases that are used to form them. In this case, on one strand, starting at the five prime end, I have thymine, guanine, adenine, and cytosine. On my second strand of DNA, I know that as anti parallel to each other. So in this case, I start with the three prime end going down to the five prime end. If we were to name this complementary strand, I would start down here at the five prime end. This would be guanine, thymine, cytosine, and adenine. As an example, if I have one strand of DNA which has a sequence from the five prime end to the three prime end of A, A, G, C, T, A, C, G, G, C, T, T, A, C, T, its complementary strand would, again, start from the three prime end, in this case, to the left, and the five prime end to the right. I would have a complementary nitrogenous base. For every T, I have an A. For every C, I have a G. For every A, I have a T, and so forth. And so I can actually determine the primary structure of both my starting DNA strand and my complementary 
DNA strand. Let's review all the details about DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's found in the cell nucleus. It's used as either in the replication process or as the RNA template for proteins. Its unit structure or monomer are nucleotides. Those nucleotides contain a deoxyribosugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base. The deoxyribosugar contains a hydrogen at the two prime position. If I look over here at this representation, that would be the two prime position and there's a hydrogen there. It is the D isomer and it is also the beta anomer. The phosphate group is ionic and it is considered it to be the conjugate base of phosphoric acid. The nitrogenous base are heterocyclic amines, all four of them here. There are two of them that are pyrimidine derivatives. They, in other words, they have thymine and cytosine. Those ones here, thymine and cytosine, are one six-membered ring. Two of them are also purine derivatives, adenine and guadenine. If I look at adenine, it's a two cyclic fused cyclic compound, and guanine is also. It is a linear polymer, and it's bridged together with these three prime comma five prime phosphodiester linkages. And there are two of those ester linkages between the two different sugars starting at the three prime end of the sugar and the five prime end of the sugar. They are complementary strands. In other words, they're base paired up by guanine having three hydrogen bonds to cytosine, adenine having two hydrogen bonds to thymine. And there's that results in a three-dimensional structure, which is an alpha double helix. Perform a practice exercise where we determine the sequence of bases in the complementary strand, starting with the following sequence of thymine, thymine, cytosine, adenine, guanine, thymine, going from five prime end to three prime end. Let's first draw this out a little bit more. I could represent this as just a linear structure here of the nitrogenous bases using a one letter acronym for each nitrogenous base. What that means, of course, is that I still have to have my sugar on there and my phosphate group, and they're linked together by these phosphodiester linkages. So in this case, I have thymine, thymine, cytosine, adenine, guanine, thymine. I now need to start pairing them up. And let's start now. I know that my new complementary strand has to start at the three prime end and go to the five prime end because they're going to be complementary to each other. And thymine always pairs up with an adenine using two hydrogen bonds. Moving down to the next nitrogenous base, again, I have my thymine forming two hydrogen bonds to adenine, cytosine, three hydrogen bonds to guanine adenine, two hydrogen bonds to thymine, guanine, three hydrogen bonds to cytosine, and finally, thymine, two hydrogen bonds to adenine. This would be my complementary st structure here, and it's all base paired up. So if I were to write the complementary strand right below my original nucleic acid strand, I need to start at the three prime end and go to the five prime end because I have to have all of my nitrogenous base is paired up. This all leads to a alpha helix three-dimensional structure. The structure of DNA as the alpha double helix was discovered in collaboration between several different groups across the world. One of those was Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin working together doing x-ray crystallography of DNA. This is a picture of their spectrum as shown here. If you interpret this data, it shows that there are two strands of DNA bound together in an alpha helix.
Watson and Crick working in Cavendish Labs in Cambridge, England, they took that x-ray crystallography data along with other information that they had on the amount of adenine and guanine, cytosine and thiamine, and some other studies, and they put it together to propose an alpha double helix of interlocking spirals to create this DNA molecule. Watson, Crick, and Wilkins all received the Nobel Prize in 1962 for their work on DNA. Rosalind Franklin did not. She passed away before she could be awarded the Nobel Prize. But there were a lot of other people that worked to actually determine that alpha helix structure. One of them was actually Linda Gerstein. She was the lab technician as an undergraduate student who actually did all of the work on DNA as the lab technician. So she knows Watson and Crick very well. This is a picture of her along with me up on Ossawinamakee Lake a few years ago. She is just a neighbor of ours up there. We often talk about nucleic acids in the context of genes. Genes are just very long strands of DNA. In fact, those genes in a human can be up to three meters long, which seems very long. And all of that DNA needs to be stuffed into the very small nucleus of every single cell within our body. In other words, there must be some way of organizing that very long strand of DNA to get it down into the nucleus. When it is organized into a three-dimensional structure, we call that structure a chromosome. It's just a series of nucleic acids that have been organized into this chromosomal structure. Let's now look at how that structure is formed. One of the first things that happens is that three meter long chain of DNA is coiled around some proteins, which are called histones. So in this diagram here, this sort of helical structure represents the double helix of DNA. Inside are eight proteins called histones. The DNA is organized around them. These individual groups here called nucleosomes consist of eight histones in a loop of DNA. Those are in turn organized in a living organism into a solenoid, which is a six nucleosomes, each of these being a nucleosome, in a spiral also. This is another representation of that solenoid. Here is my alpha double helix going around here. Here are my eight histone proteins. They're linked by a small portion of DNA, and this continues on for three plus meters of DNA. We're sort of organizing it to get it into a smaller shape to fit inside that nucleus. Those solenoid loops of histones and DNA are further organized into bands. This is just looking at them internally here, where each of these are loops of my solenoid loops. If I look at them edge on, I can see they sort of look like a circular structure, and they eventually come together in these stacked mini bands here to form this chromosomal structure here. When we look under the microscope at the nucleus of a cell when it's doing cell division, we see these individual chromosomes appear. That is the ordered structure of that long strand of DNA. That genetic information within a chromosome is buried deep inside of that chromosome. In order to access that data, we need to start unwrapping portions of that chromosome to expose the individual nucleotides. So if we look at this diagram here, I have the nucleus which contains the chromosomes. The chromosomes exist as these sort of multi-bands of looped up solenoids. I further sort of expand it and start to unwind it. I get my solenoids. I finally get to my 
DNA wrapped around those eight protein histones. I finally exposed the DNA nucleic acids. If we look at just a portion of that genetic information, the new nitrogenous bases that are on there, we call that a gene. That is the genetic information we use for either replication or for protein synthesis. In all living organisms that contain DNA, these nucleic acid molecules interact with histone proteins and some more organizational processes to form chromosomes. The major function of a chromosome, again, is to fold and organize these very long DNA sequences so that they can be found tightly packed into the nucleus. A chromosome is only about 15% DNA. About 80% by mass is actually those histone proteins. If we look at different species, they have different numbers of chromosomes. Therefore, they have different types of DNA. An example is that a human contains about 46 chromosomes. Mosquitoes contain six, frogs have 26, and dogs have 78 chromosomes in their cells. I don't know if that tells you anything about the evolution of a species or their intelligence. However, I do know that at least our dog is very intelligent. Chromosomes always appear in matched pairs or called homologous pairs, and those are our chromatids. So here is an example of a human chromosome. It exists as a homologous pair. Each of them contains a double helix of DNA nucleic acids. This is just a picture taken of a chromosome up close. Human cells have 46 chromosomes. Those are in 23 homologous pairs. Let's now look at a video which shows the molecular visualization of the DNA strands being transformed into a chromosome. In this animation, we'll see the remarkable way our DNA is tightly packed up so that six feet of this long molecule fits into the microscopic nucleus of every cell. The process starts when DNA is wrapped around special protein molecules called histones. The combined loop of DNA and protein is called a nucleosome. Next, the nucleosomes are packaged into a thread. The end result is a fiber known as chromatin. This fiber is then looped and coiled yet again. Leading finally to the familiar shapes known as chromosomes, which can be seen in the nucleus of dividing cells. Let's look at the DNA replication process. That's the process where I copy and make an exact duplicate of each DNA strand. Some DNA strands contain over 140 million base pairs in a chromosome. So if I look at one of the chains in my DNA molecule, I first need to start unwrapping it making it so that I expose my nitrogenous bases. At that point, there is an enzyme called DNA polymerase that brings in nucleotides from the surrounding solution, and it allows them to base pair up with each other. Guanine with cytosine, 
adenine with thymine. And then all I need to do to make a complementary strand of this original parent DNA nucleic acid chain is to make a phosphodiester bond between my phosphate group and my sugar. This process is considered semi-conservative in the fact that my newly synthesized DNA has one new DNA strand and one old DNA strand. So my two new molecules of DNA, they're identical to each other, and they can each contain an old strand and a new strand. The duplication of a DNA molecule called the replication process, if it started at one end of the molecule and worked its way over to the other end, it would take a long time because there are 140 million base pairs in some DNA molecules that would have to be replicated. What happens is instead is that the DNA polymerase enzyme starts to actually unwind the double helix at multiple points on the DNA strand, and then it starts to add my nucleotides, base pairing them with my original strands and creating two strands of DNA. This point that is unwinding is known as a replication fork, and I start adding nucleotides in both directions at a later stage in the replication process, these two replication forks eventually get close together, and then I end up with two new daughter DNAs. Each of these daughter DNAs contains one of the original DNA molecules and its complementary base. If we look closer at just a short section of that DNA and the replication process here, we notice here is the replication fork. In this case, my five prime end of my new DNA strand moves toward the three prime end. So in other words, I'm starting off at the three prime end of my original DNA nucleic acid. I start adding from the five prime end of my new DNA strand. That's because the catalyst, the DNA polymerase, can only add nucleotides in the five prime to three prime end. If I start here, I move from the five prime end toward the three prime end of my new DNA strand. However, in the other strand of my original molecule, I need to also start at the five prime end, and I need to do that in just short segments. Because once I start adding nucleotides and my starting point here gets close to my finishing point on this part, they don't interact. That DNA polymerase can no longer bridge those two. Let's take a look at this process a little closer and look at some of the terms associated with the replication process of both strands of my original DNA. So these blue lines here represent my original DNA strands. I have one that starts off at three prime here and goes to five prime. I have one that starts out at five prime and goes to three prime. My DNA polymerase starts adding nucleotides we call this a leading strand because it can grows continuously. As I start to unwind, I discontinue adding nucleic acids that base pair up with the original. I then the, combine the phosphate and the sugar through a phosphodiester linkage. On the complementary strand of my original DNA, I also still need to add my nucleotides from the five prime end to the three prime end. In this case, these individual little segments here are called Okasaki fragments, and we call this the lagging strand. So I grow in two different ways. I have a leading strand, which grows continuously, and I have a lagging strand, which grows in little segments. Okay. So the Okazaki fragments, 
are later connected by another enzyme. So each of these little areas shown here as what we call a nick, those are have another enzyme which combines these two through a phosphodiester linkage, eventually creating two new strands of DNA that are identical to each other. Let's now take a closer and a sequential look at the DNA replication process. We start off with the parent DNA, which is a double helix organized into a superstructure known as a chromosome. As that superstructure starts to unfold, we form a strand of DNA, which is still in the double helix. There is a enzyme called gyrase which prevents that strand of DNA from recoiling up into a chromosome. There is a second enzyme which unwinds the DNA and it starts to separate my base pairs forming two different single strands of DNA shown here in blue. These two pairs would like to come back together however at some point there are some proteins that bind to the strands to prevent them from actually recombining before the replication is complete. There is another set of proteins that helps thread my DNA polymerase enzyme into that single strand which is now forming. And it is the DNA polymerase that starts to assemble the nucleotides joining those base pairs of my leading strand to my newly replicated strand shown here in green. If we look at that total structure, we call this a daughter DNA, and that's the leading strand daughter DNA. We're also going to make another daughter DNA here with the second strand, but in this case, I have to start replicating from the five prime end of my new formed. There is a set of enzymes that are synthesized, which we call RNA primers. They prime that section of my new strand for accepting the nucleotides. And then my primers sort of provide a starting point for my nucleotide addition. And I have my same DNA polymerase. In this case, it starts to assemble those nucleotides, joining my base pairs until I reach up with another primer. There is a, another DNA polymerase molecule that then replaces those original RNA nucleotides with a DNA nucleotide and joins the different strands together of my legging strand. We then have a ligase protein, which actually does the chemical reaction to form that phosphodiester linkage here, eventually forming a second daughter DNA from the lagging strand. We'll call this the lagging strand DNA. The general end game is that I've created two new strands of DNA, which then would self-organize back into that superstructure. Let's look at that DNA replication process in a video. Using computer animation based on molecular research, we are now able to see how DNA is actually copied in living cells. You are looking at an assembly line of amazing miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA double helix and cranking out a copy of each strand. The DNA to be copied enters the production line from bottom left. The whirling blue molecular machine is called helicase. It spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine as it unwinds the double helix into two strands. One strand is copied continuously and can be seen spooling off to the right. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules.
Let's now look at the second process which DNA information is used. That's where we take that information that's present in DNA, in other words, the sequence of nitrogenous bases, and we use that information to synthesize proteins. This is often known as the central dogma of molecular biology. That's because all of biology starts out by using the DNA to make proteins. Let's graphically look at those processes used to take the information from DNA and produce proteins. I start off with a double helix of DNA and I take a specific section of that DNA. We're gonna call that section a genotype. We're gonna take the information stored in the nitrogenous bases and transcribe it from the DNA a language to the RNA language. In other words, wherever I have a thymine in one strand, I have an adenine in an RNA strand. Wherever I have an adenine, I have a uracil. Essentially, I'm making a transcribed molecule of RNA from the DNA molecule. Then we translate that from the language of RNA to the language of proteins going from nitrogenous bases to amino acids. AUG represents the code for methionine. CGG represents the code for the amino acid arginine. UAC represents the code for tyrosine. And UAA represents the code for the amino acid leucine. So two processes, transcription, which takes the information stored in DNA and synthesizes a messenger RNA molecule. That messenger RNA molecule can leave the nucleus where DNA cannot. So it's moving the code out of the nucleus into the rest of the cell known as the cytoplasm. Translation is the process by which messenger RNA is deciphered to synthesize a protein. So once I get that string of messenger RNA out there, there is a set of enzymes which uses that information to assemble different amino acids to make up a protein. And we'll take a closer look at all of these processes. Let's take a closer look at the individual steps that lead toward protein synthesis using the information stored in DNA. We start off with DNA in the nucleus, which serves as a template and is transcribed to the RNA molecule, which can then leave the nucleus. That messenger RNA molecule contains three letter codons different nitrogenous bases, which actually represent different amino acids. That messenger RNA moves into the cytoplasm and becomes associated with what is known as ribosomes. These are also enzymes. Inside that ribosome, I have that messenger RNA being pulled through there. I have what is known as transfer RNA, bringing in amino acids from the cytoplasm inside the ribosome. I connect those up through ester linkages and eventually I make a polypeptide chain. So we're taking the information stored in DNA, bringing it out through messenger RNA to the ribosomal enzyme at which point I have a transfer RNA that brings in the amino acids in the correct order. Eventually, I get a, my transfer RNA departs and it goes on to another ribosome to make more protein. The process in going from the information stored in DNA to protein synthesis contains several other steps that are not listed in that last slide. If I look in the nucleus, there is a DNA molecule in there, which can be used to either replicate that DNA to forming new cells, 
or it can be transcribed and translated into proteins, there are a few other steps that are involved. The initial transcription process produces a RNA molecule known as heterogeneous nuclear RNA, and it is formed directly from the DNA. That heterogeneous nuclear RNA is then modified a bit by another RNA molecule called small nuclear RNA. Eventually, I form what is known as messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA contains between 100 and 200 different nucleotide sequences. That is the genetic information that is copied from the DNA. That messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and goes into the cellular cytoplasm, where it is combined in ribosomal RNA, known as the ribosome. It is combined with transfer RNA, which is bringing in the amino acids that are floating around here in the cytoplasm. Inside that ribosomal RNA, that's where we start to synthesize, forming those peptide bonds between amino acids to produce my proteins. Again, the information started out at DNA and it is transcribed and then translated into the language of proteins. The whole gene is not transcribed and translated into proteins. A short segment of DNA known as a gene is the base sequence responsible for the production of a very specific protein. For example, if I look at this graphic here, this section of the DNA molecule is called the gene. It's responsible for making this protein. This section is another gene. It's responsible for the brown protein. And this third section here is a separate gene. It's responsible for this blue protein. In general, these genes are around 1,000 to 3,500 nucleotides long. So each of these sequences of here being around 1,000 to 3,500 nucleotides long, those are the information stored in the DNA that are used to make my proteins. So the genome is all the genetic material together. So if I take all of my genetic material, we call that a genome. The individual sequence responsible for the code in making proteins is known as the gene. So the human genome, meaning all of the DNA in the nucleus of a cell, is about 20,000 to 25,000 genes. That means we can manufacture at least 20,000 to 25,000 genes. However, there are more than that many known proteins in a living organism. So there must be some other mechanism to, to take that information and make more than just one protein out of it. Let's look at a step-by-step -step explanation of the steps in transcription. The DNA double helix is unwound. It is unwound at several different points here. It is unwound by the enzyme called RNA polymerase. Free nucleotides are then aligned with the DNA strand. We'll call that the template forming new base pairs. So I start to bring in new base pairs. RNA polymerase then catalyzes the linkage of those ribonucleotides one by one to eventually form a strand of heterogeneous nuclear RNA, again, going from the five prime end of my new strand to the three prime end. Then my transcription ends based on what is called a gene. There is a separate RNA polymerase it in, that encounters a stop signal that says, this is the end of my DNA sequence. This is the end of my heterogeneous nuclear RNA molecule. So now my DNA winds up again. My heterogeneous nuclear RNA is released from the DNA. That initially transcribed heterogeneous nuclear RNA
needs to be further modified to produce messenger RNA, which can leave the nucleus. This process is called splicing, and it involves small nuclear RNA. So if I take heterogeneous nuclear RNA and I start to splice it, I tend to remove sections of my heterogeneous nuclear RNA, which contains the wrong information for the proteins that I need to synthesize. And finally, I join those sections back up again to form messenger RNA. The sections that are cut out are called introns. The sections that are joined back together are called exons. Now I have the right information for producing proteins. One way that the information stored in DNA can be used to synthesize different proteins is during that splicing process. There are some alternative ways that the molecules can be spliced and recombined to form different sequences of messenger RNA. For example, if I start out here with a heterogeneous nuclear RNA, which is directly transcribed from the DNA, once I start to splice them, I can remove sections and then I can put them back together as my exons in different ways. For example, I can put this part of the molecule back together in a yellow, blue, brown section. That's the messenger RNA for producing one protein. Or I can put them back together, just using graphics again, in the yellow, green, brown section. That's a second protein. And I could continue that. I can take my molecules and combine them to form a long messenger RNA molecule, my third protein, or I can use that to form a fourth protein, a smaller section of that. And this process is ongoing all the time because the number of genes that we have in the DNA is not enough to account for all the proteins. Therefore, scientists have looked into this closely and found that we have this splicing process mitigated by the small nuclear RNA to convert heterogeneous nucle nucleic acid into messenger RNA molecules, which then exit the nucleus and go on to make proteins. Let's now look again at the steps in the transcription process, but let's include that splicing process I start off with my DNA. I do a partial unwinding. I start to transcribe that information on that certain section of my DNA, which we're going to call a, dean, a gene. I have an initial stopping point and a termination stopping point here. After I replicate, I've made what is known as a heterogeneous nuclear RNA strand that then tends to separate from my DNA molecule and my DNA rewinds up into the double helix. And then my small nuclear RNA does that exon and intron splicing to form my messenger RNA. Let's look at a video showing the transcription process from DNA to RNA. What you are about to see is DNA's most extraordinary secret. How a simple code is turned into flesh and blood. It begins with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene. A gene is simply a length of DNA instructions stretching away to the left. The assembled factors trigger the first phase of the process reading off the information that will be needed to make the protein. Everything is ready to roll. Three, two, one, go. The blue molecule racing along the DNA is reading the gene. 
It's unzipping the double helix and copying one of the two strands. The yellow chain snaking out of the top is a copy of the genetic message, and it's made of a close chemical cousin of DNA called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole. They are matched to the DNA, letter by letter, to copy the A's, C's, T's, and G's of the gene. The only difference is that in the RNA copy, the letter T is replaced with a closely related building block known as U. You are watching this process called transcription in real time. It's happening right now in almost every cell in your body. Let's now look at some of the steps in the translation process. My messenger RNA has left the nucleus into the cytoplasm. It contains the genetic information that can be translated into the language of proteins. That code is in separate nitrogenous bases in groups of three. For example, in a small section of the messenger RNA, there exists an adenine, uracil, and cytosine nitrogenous base sequence. That messenger RNA then moves in and gets clamped between two ribosomal subunits. Those subunits come together and sort of clamp over that messenger RNA molecule again. That messenger RNA molecule has a short sequence of three nitrogenous bases, A, U, and C. There is another form of RNA that exists in the cytoplasm called transfer RNA. It also has a set of three nitrogenous bases on it that are the complementary pairs to my messenger RNA. So I have AUC on my messenger RNA somewhere along that chain. I have these transfer RNA molecules which have the complementary bases on it. Attached to those complementary bases on the transfer RNA molecule is an amino acid. That mess transfer RNA matches up and base pairs with that sequence on my messenger RNA shown here with these sort of dotted lines here. In other words, it's bringing that amino acid in to my ribosomal RNA where it forms peptide bonds between amino acids. And then that transfer RNA exits the molecule where it goes and picks up another amino acid. And it picks up the amino acid associated with that information on the transfer RNA. We call that the anticodon. We call the information on the original messenger RNA as the codon. Eventually, my RNA also exits my ribosomal RNA, and it gets clamped onto more ribosomal subunits, and they start making proteins. The information used to make proteins is contained in the base sequence in messenger RNA, in other words, the sequence of nitrogenous bases. That information is used to put amino acids in the correct, se correct sequence for making a protein. For example, if I look over here, the AUG codon represents the methionine anticodon. So a codon is a three nucleotide sequence defined by its nitrogenous base within a messenger RNA molecule that represents a specific amino acid. Methionine information is contained on the transfer RNA anticodon. If we look at CGG, that represents arginine. UAC represents tyrosine. UAA represents leucine. So in the translation process, I use that information 
of three consecutive nitrogenous base sequences to represent my different amino acids which come together to form my peptide. Well, we know that there are 20 common amino acids in the human body that make up all of our proteins, yet there are four different nitrogenous bases. So when we do all the mathematics, that comes up with 64 possible different ways to put those four nitrogenous bases sequence to form the three nucleotide sequences called codons here. For example, if I look at serine, UCU represents serine, UCC, UCA, and UCG also represent serine. So there are a lot more codons than there are amino acids. In other words, there's some redundancy here. Also, if I look down here to the right, there are two other codons that represent serine. If we sort of put those all together, I can see that these are all redundancies. There are six codons for leucine. There are four codons for threonine. There are four codons for glycine. Also, there are some special codons here. AUG is actually an initiation codon, and that always comes first in my sequence. That tells me, start making my protein here, and that's going to be the methionine. There are also several different termination codons. Those are codes that say, this is the end of my polypeptide chain. Quit putting amino acids in. That defines how long my polypeptide chain is. That information comes from my messenger RNA molecule, which comes from my DNA molecule. The genetic code for making proteins is almost universal. With a few minor exceptions, the code is the same in all organisms. In other words, the same codons specify the same amino acids, whether that cell is a bacteria cell, a corn cell, or a human cell. This chart so is just about universal. Within the genetic information of our messenger RNA molecule, there exists a codon that initiates protein synthesis and one that terminates protein synthesis. These can be thought of as either the beginning or the end of a gene. The codon, which codes for the amino acid methionine, AUG, functions as the initiation codon. That says, this is the beginning of my protein chain, and it is also the beginning of my gene. There exist three different codons that we call stop codons. They are at the end of our gene, and that says, stop putting amino acids onto my growing polypeptide chain. We call those stop codons. During protein synthesis, there needs to be a method for taking that information stored on messenger RNA in those three nitrogenous base sequences, or my codons. During protein synthesis, the amino acids that are in the cytoplasm do not directly interact with the codons on the messenger RNA molecule. There is an intermediate molecule called transfer RNA that is used to deliver those amino acids over to the messenger RNA within the ribosome. Two features about transfer RNA. There are amino acids that are covalently bonded to the three prime end of a transfer RNA molecule via an ester linkage. So if I look at the structure of a transfer RNA molecule, it is also a nucleic acid with a five prime and a three prime end. At the three prime end, it forms an ester linkage to an amino acid. And that amino acid is specific for the type of transfer RNA molecule that is. At the bottom end of this transfer RNA a molecule, there is an anticodon, which is the base pairing nitrogenous bases that match up with the base pairing on the messenger RNA 
molecule to sort of fulfill that genetic code. So example here, if I have a messenger RNA molecule, that is where my information is stored for doing protein synthesis. I have a transfer RNA molecule, which has an identical but base paired code to my messenger RNA. For example, if I have a messenger RNA molecule with the AUG code, there exists a transfer RNA molecule that has the opposite code of UAC, which would base pair with my AUG. And in this case, that UAC contains the methionine amino acid. That's my starting amino acid. One of the first steps in translation is to activate that transfer RNA molecule, and that is done by a specific enzyme. In this case, I have an amino acyl transfer RNA synthetases. Those are my enzymes used to form the ester linkage between my three prime end of my transfer RNA molecule and the carboxylic acid end of my amino acid to form an ester linkage. Here you can see the diagram here. I have my transfer RNA molecule with an amino acid now bound to it through a covalent bond. So here we are in the translation process. I have my messenger RNA, which contains a codon. It's a three nitrogen nitrogenous base codon. I have a transfer RNA, which has a three base anticodon, which is the base pair of my codon. It also contains an amino acid, which is specific for that anticodon based on the enzyme that's used. They then come together in the ribosome to actually start doing a chemical reaction where that amino acid is put together with another amino acid to form a peptide bond within this ribosomal RNA molecule. Let's take a closer look at that sort of factory of proteins here, the ribosomal RNA. The next step in translation, where we're gonna take the information stored in messenger RNA codons and decipher them to make protein molecules, it occurs in a unit called a ribosome, which is mostly RNA, but also contains some protein. It usually has two different forms, a large subunit and a small subunit that come together during protein synthesis. About 65% of the ribosome is RNA, and about 35% is this protein. Together, they make up an enzyme that catalyzes the reactions between amino acids to form proteins. We call this enzyme a ribozyme. The ribozyme's active site, which does the catalysis, is within the large subunit. The small subunit is used to bind the messenger RNA to the transfer RNA during protein synthesis. The initiation of protein synthesis starts by the messenger RNA binding to the ribosomal subunit, the small one, at its start codon, AUG, in other words, the code for methionine and it occupies a small cleft within that protein called the P site, which is often referred to as the peptidal site. That's the growing peptide site. That's where the amino acids are brought in. Methionine then binds to the transfer RNA molecule, as shown here. Again, these are base paired up. And then the large ribosome unit comes in and binds to make a complex for protein synthesis. The next step is elongation of my growing amino acid chain here. So adjacent to the P site is another site called the A site. 
that's where the next transfer RNA molecule brings in the appropriate amino acid with the correct anticodan. So if I look at this, if I have a G, G, G here on my messenger RNA code, I have to have a C, C, C here on my transfer RNA anticodon. Those are then held in together with each other, and I can now undergo a peptide bond reaction to start to form my growing amino acid. In order for that process to continue to grow up my amino acid peptide chain, my ribosomal units sort of move along my messenger RNA molecule. My transfer RNA molecule brings in another amino acid, again, based on base pairing. For every C, there's a G. For every G, there's a C. And every A, there's a U here. Bringing in that brings it into the A site there. And then I start to form another peptide bond between glycine, in this case, and alanine. Our elongation process continues, adding one amino acid at a time to my growing polypeptide or protein chain. That process continues until I hit a termination codon, which is either UAG, UAA, or UGA. At that point, there are some post-translation process. First, I need to release my messenger RNA from the ribosome. And then, and in a separate process, I actually cut off that methionine amino acid from my protein chain. The process of making proteins using the information on messenger RNA and creating peptide bonds within the ribosome happens simultaneously along several points within the messenger RNA molecule. So as I have one site coming together here, my large subunit and my small subunit, I already have somewhere along that messenger RNA molecule a protein being synthesized in several different spots. That is a very efficient way to actually make a lot of proteins. We call this a polysome. That's because there are multiple small and large subunits that are, exist at the same time along a gene. The translation process. When the RNA copy is complete, it snakes out into the outer part of the cell. Then, in a dazzling display of choreography, all the components of a molecular machine lock together around the RNA to form a miniature factory called a ribosome. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a string of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, bring each amino acid to the ribosome. The amino acids are the small red tips attached to the transfer molecules. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids. Each transfer molecule carries a three-letter code that is matched with the RNA in the machine. Now we come to the heart of the process. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. The code for each amino acid is read off, three letters at a time, and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecules. When the right transfer molecule plugs in, the amino acid it carries is added to the growing protein chain. Again, you are watching this in real time. And after a few seconds, the assembled protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Ribosomes can make any kind of protein. It just depends what genetic message you feed in on the RNA. In this case, 
the end product is hemoglobin. The cells in our bone marrow churn out a hundred trillion molecules of it per second. And as a result, our muscles, brain, and all the vital organs in our body receive the oxygen they need. The genetic sequence and the processes of reproducing that sequence during replication or transcription is not perfect. Every once in a while there is an error in that base sequence. We call that error a mutation. Any errors in the genetic information are passed on during transcription. So for example, if I have an error, that altered genetic information causes a change in the amino acid sequence during protein synthesis. If I do not have the correct sequence, I will alter the function of the amino acid by altering the three-dimensional shape of that protein. Mutations are caused by mutagens. Those are substances that cause a change in the structure of a gene. For example, if I look at this diagram here, in this specific sequence of a DNA molecule, I would like to have a cysteine and a guanine molecule paired up here. But if I have a mutation, when I do the transcription process, instead I get a T and an A paired up here. That's going to produce a protein that is no longer functional. Mutations in our DNA code can be caused by ionizing radiation. In other words, radiation that can actually start to break bonds. Those include ultraviolet radiation from the sun, x-rays, radioactivity, and cosmic radiation. If we look at ultraviolet radiation, that is one of the major causes of skin cancer because it has altered our DNA sequences. Lung cancer is caused by radon, which is a radioactivity molecule that is found in rocks and sand. And also radiation from like nuclear reactors or x-rays or things like that, they can cause thyroid cancer. If we look at just radon in the United States, we notice here that radon is very high in areas along the Missouri River. In other words, we can correlate that radon to cancer risks from that radiation. In other words, I can alter my gene sequence because I ionize some of the bonds that make up my DNA molecule. If we look at radioactivity. Back in the 1950s and 60s, we did a lot of nuclear testing out here in Utah. The winds at that time blew all that radiation toward the Midwest. So there are areas in Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska that have high levels of cancer patients due to radiation affecting the DNA within their bodies. It's ionized the molecules and caused mutations. There are a number of chemical agents that have been found to create mutations in DNA. An example of that is nitrous acid, which can convert cytosine to uracil. If we do that in an RNA molecule, we're going to have a mutation in the genetic code. Lots of times we associate these nitrous acid molecules with bacon or with the fertilizers used by farmers. Normally, new mutations are repaired by repair enzymes and they are not passed on to the next generation, which is a benefit. There are lots of places that warn you about the effect of chemical agents. They saying like this area here contains chemicals known by the state of California to cause cancer, birth defects, or other reproductive harm. Those effects are due to changes in the genetic information contained in DNA due to the reaction with other chemical reagents. Another example of 
mutation causing items are cell irritants for example if we look at asbestos fibers they have been linked to mesothelioma which is lung cancer these fibers get down in the lungs and they tend to cause mutations within the cells of the lungs in 1960s they outlawed the use of asbestos in either ceiling covers pipe insulation walls or even in floor tiles that's because of the very strong link between asbestos fibers and lung cancer due to the mutations within the dna viruses are organisms that can actually cause mutations within the dna of a cell viruses are tiny disease causing agents that consist of an outer protein envelope and an inner nucleic acid core so if i look at this dramatic picture of a virus this outside is made up of protein and the inside is made up of nucleic acids they cannot reproduce outside of a living cell so they invade other organisms like bacteria animals plants and humans once they invade that species they actually introduce their dna into the cell and they convince the cell to start making more viruses many diseases have a viral origin including the common cold smallpox rabies influenza hepatitis and aids a vaccine can be introduced into a living organism which is an inactive virus or bacteria in other words they disrupt that dna they kill this virus and then once you give that to an organism like a human it convinces the cells and the tissue to start making antibodies which will prevent a living virus from coming in and transferring its DNA over to our cells. Altering the genetic code can also be done by humans on purpose. We call that genetic engineering, where we intentionally change the DNA to exhibit different traits. This was first shown where we were able to change organisms such as bacteria in 1973 we altered their dna and mice in 1974. in 1982 we were able to modify some bacteria to start making insulin so that was a beneficial process for genetic engineering many of the plants that are now growing in our fields are actually genetically engineered and they're genetically engineered to actually resist disease, drought, predators, frost, deterioration, resistance that are all been conferred. So most of the plants, for example, corn grown in the United States is genetically engineered corn. We also use genetic engineering for processes like gene therapy, where we introduce functional genes into a person's cell to correct the action of a defective gene in other words viruses are used to carry dna into the cells gene therapy is still experimental but it is growing fast so we take the genes we alter the genes and enter them into a virus a virus then can enter into our cells and give that new dna over to our cells to control its production of messenger rna and so forth also, genetic engineering has been used to clone cells that have descendants from a single cell. In other words, we make an identical DNA molecule. If that's the process used for making an early cell in the process of life, we can actually clone an entire species. Like in 1997, we were able to make a clone of a sheep called Dolly. There is always controversy associated with genetic engineering along with the promises. The cloning of animals and plants hold much promise for food production and treatment of diseases. However, there is much concern and controversy in that 
are we going to start cloning people? Are we going to go to the far extreme? We have been able to duplicate the code within a DNA molecule by using a process called polymerized chain reaction. We see this all the time in some of those crime scene investigation shows. For example, here in NCIS's forensic lab. For example, if I take the DNA obtained from either a very small blood sample or a tissue sample or a saliva sample, I send that through a denaturization process where I split that DNA up into two identical complementary strands. I then start using an annealing process where I bring in certain small change, small genetic code that actually forms a base pair with some of the parent chain DNA that's been denatured. And then I start bringing in the different nucleotides. I do this in cycles. So once I've done this once, I then go ahead and I denature it again. After I've done two cycles, I've made two eight copies of the original DNA. On the third cycle, I've made 16 copies. And on the fifth cycle, I've made 32 copies. After the 30th cycle, I have 20 billion copies of DNA, which now I can analyze in a crime scene analysis lab to determine if my thief is the same person based on their DNA. I can compare it to known DNA sequences for that person. In the early part of this century, scientists from around the world began a program to actually identify all the gene sequences of all three billion chemical nucleotides within the human cell nucleus. At the time, this took years and years and years to do. Today, we are able to do this even in the biology labs at Central Lakes College because gene sequences are fairly commonplace now. It's all automated. During that human genome project across the world, hundreds of different publications were submitted to different journals around the world. And again, it took from 2000 through 2010 to actually completely sequence the human genome. We actually found out what is the sequence of nitrogenous bases within a chromosome. Having learned that, we still don't understand what all the sections of a genome do. We don't know what some of the genes do. And that's a large part of what some of the research is ongoing now, is to identify what those sequences are used for by the body. That ends our discussion on biochemistry. We're now going to move on and talk about metabolism. And we're going to start off talking about metabolic energy production.